Well, let me just welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm so glad to see you here today. We have a really interesting topic for an experimental session today that I'm very excited about, and I'm really looking forward to it. This is a scenario exercise where we are going to be exploring what might happen if the American presidential election in November 2024 gets unsprung and gets out of control. And we're doing that to examine how it might impact higher education and how academics might respond to it. Now, to do this, again, we, let me just walk you through our timeline. The basic idea is I'm going to introduce the scenario uh, and then give you a chance to respond to it, both overall and also in small groups. And then we're going to adjust the scenario, take it further another month, and then ask you to respond to how that might work. And as we do this, uh, please assume that you are in the role you currently play, if you're a president, a student, a biologist, or whatever, or the role you'd like to play next year. So if you're job hunting right now or thinking about a promotion, um, think about that role and how this would impact you. Uh, I'd like you to also take a look at how this may impact you practically but also in a visionary way. So don't be afraid of looking at the big picture in the sector as a whole, as well as thinking about how this might impact, say, your learning management system. And you must work with everybody else here because we have wonderful people, uh, brilliant people with a wide range of ideas and backgrounds. So please feel free to collaborate as we go. So to start off, uh, what I'd like you to imagine is that it is early November 2024. The presidential election has been held and the results are a mess. Uh, there's no clear, decisive outcome. Uh, both sides, both uh, Biden and Trump, claim electoral victory. Uh, that different states have put forward different slates for the electoral college, uh, and those are competing and fighting each other in court and online. There are protests in cities across the U.S. Uh, that are growing, uh, both protests from the Democrats and from Republicans, and those protests are growing more intense as uncertainty continues to unfold. There's also quite a bit of digital everything. Uh, people are sharing their opinions online, courts are publishing opinions, people are making videos, there's also a great deal of misinformation going on, and people aren't sure how to tell what's actually happening. Uh, court cases are occurring as people are suing each other left and right. Now, within higher education, and this is where you come in, let me just give you a few things to start from. Uh, we see many academics making public statements, and that is everything from presidents to professors to staff to students, and the statements appear every, everywhere from uh, traditional media and newspapers and television to TikTok to all kinds of digital media. We're seeing more and more student protests, uh, and those will, of course, tend towards the Democratic side, but not exclusively, uh, and these protests sometimes clash with each other on the same campus. The organization Turning Point has been calling out individual professors for accusing them of either being disloyal or causing strife politically, and they've been doxing some of those professors and trying to share evidence of them. There's also growing pressure for universities and professional associations to take sides in the conflict, to issue statements that call out for us to do one or other things. So my first question to you, and this is for everybody as a whole, is to ask, what questions do you have about this scenario? Um, what would you like to learn more about? And again, either hit the chat box or on the, on the bottom of the screen, that white strip, uh, click the uh, uh, question box to uh, type in a Q&A. Uh, what questions do you have about how this actually occurs and takes place? And hello to people who just joined us that I didn't get to greet before. Um, hello to Ellen and Fort Collins. Oh, I'm sorry things are dry there. Uh, I'm just here in California and there's been a ton of rain which they badly needed. Um, hello, Chris in Santa Fe. And Robin Sullivan, always good to see you. Uh, Chris says, we've already had, we already had a preview. This is quite true, uh, that in uh, 2020, especially January 6th, uh, we had uh, examples of how this might occur. 
Uh, Christopher Nelson asks a really good question. Uh, in the scenario, are votes still being counted? In some states, uh, it's already done. In other states, there are recounts going on. Hello, Roxanne from Connecticut. Uh, Wendy says, how do the networks call the election? Very, very good question. Uh, all of the networks have uh, concluded who they think has won. Uh, most of them have concluded that Biden has won. Some think that Trump has won. Both cite polling data, exit polling data, and whatever information they can find. Meredith asks Heather in acts of violence. Very few so far, and violence against property, not against people. Vanessa suggests we appoint Mike Caulfield this information czar. Uh, hang on a second, we're coming to that. Um, and uh, we also have one question coming up right here. Um, Seth Fierney asks, what is the President Biden doing about the chaos, calling out the National Guard? Uh, not yet. Um, the, uh, uh, there are multiple lawsuits, uh, but a lot of this is happening at the state level, uh, and we haven't seen any immediate changes to federal, uh, federal um, uh, action. Uh, Seth also asked, what is Congress doing, if anything, right now? Some in the House of Representatives are calling for that body to determine the election. Uh, some are calling out, of course, you know, uh, praising their, uh, their own candidate on both sides. So the House of Representatives, uh, and to a lesser extent, the Senate, are both kind of microcosms of the nation. Joseph asked if ChatGPT is still functioning. Yes. Uh, in this scenario, please uh, assume that the full range of generative AI is available. Everything from Gemini from Google to Microsoft's Copilot to Hugging Faces open source alternatives to Meta's Llama um, uh, to uh, ChatGPT, etc. Uh, Phil Katz, uh, our American historian, asks a really good question. Uh, how many members of Congress are also in disputed elections, the state officials? Um, some members of Congress, just a handful right now. Uh, John Hollenbeck asks, uh, I'm assuming Trump is acting like Trump while Biden is reacting to him. Uh, so far, uh, although Biden is also charging Trump with um, causing election chaos. Uh, Chris has quoted Elon and Taylor said, um, uh, Good question. Uh, I don't have a good answer for Elon, but Taylor, I assume you mean Taylor Swift? Christopher asks, are nations threatening to secede from the US? Not yet. Uh, David asks, is there a potential government shutdown at the moment? Perhaps the budget on the brink? Not right now, but it's gonna make negotiations for the next crisis much, much harder. Ah. And Seth asks another great question. Is there evidence of interference, misinformation by outside actors? There is no evidence. There are competing claims. Uh, and we are seeing Republicans claim China is intervening on behalf of the Biden administration. And we're seeing Democratic claims that Russia is intervening on behalf of, uh, of Trump. Um, both na neither nation, uh, neither China nor Russia has uh, admitted to doing this. Uh, and it is still early days with a lot of back and forth about this. Joseph asks how many seats in Congress have independence won? Uh, zero right now. Uh, Roberta asks uh, if it's possible to share the scenario again in the chat. She was called away. Uh, sure, I think I can share a little bit of that right now. Um, this is going to be a little ungainly, but it's going to be in the form of uh, just text. So here, I'm just going to copy and paste this in or better and tell me if you can read it. Um, and everybody else can also help right now. Um, and Roberta, I'm putting the scenario, but also some of the initial uh, uh, higher education responses. You're most welcome, Roberta. All right. Now, I'd like to ask you all together, um, if you could think right now, um, oh, uh, sorry, one more question has come up, a really, really nice one from Richard Wack. What parallels or lessons learned might we draw from the hanging Chad election controversy from the 2000 election? Two lessons. One is that um, people are looking hard at the physical mechanics of voting, hence some of the recounts, as well as charges of uh, vote tampering, but also the role of the Supreme Court. Uh, multiple court cases are flowing upwards in that direction. Uh, Doug, the markets are really, really uneasy. Uh, Chris, the Supreme Court has not ruled anything right now. Now, how do you respond? 
how do you react to this? Imagine yourself either again in your current role or in the role you'd like to have. How does this play out in your work? Think, for example, about your professional identity, your professional associations. Think about your institution, if it's a campus or a library or a museum. Think about how you'd interact with other people. Uh, Chris in the chat says that as a teacher, this is a teaching moment. Um, and here, actually, let me just uh, quickly fix up the uh, um, screen here. Um, this is a teaching moment. Um, and I, I assume by Chris, that means you're going to see a lot of uh, teach ins and uh, different faculty in different areas, notably poli sci and government uh, working on this. Uh, Christopher Nelson says, as an administrator, this is for the moment a calm down and carry on moment. So keep everything, Christopher, if I'm right, keep everything operating, uh, no sudden reactions. Uh, Wendy Williams says, as a faculty developer, it's also a teaching moment for helping faculty discuss disinformation with their students. That's excellent, Wendy. Do you, uh, do you see uh, librarians and technologists playing a role in that? Very good, very good. Those are two very, very important points. And Christopher Nelson, if you could just say why that might happen. Uh, I'm sorry, why why the uh, keep calm and carry on idea. Uh, John Hollenbeck says he is an election official and he gets called in, um, there, which is that it's interesting. So some academics are going to actually be election officials in different levels too. Uh, Chris adds it's a good time to engage citizenship. Uh, yeah, can you say a bit more about that, Chris? Uh, Joellen Parker, as usual, has a brilliant comment. Donors are using their giving to press the institution to take positions they prefer. So imagine uh, Republican donors who are asking their campuses to take a pro-Trump uh, stance. Imagine Democratic donors asking the opposite. Very, very good. Um, Chris, that's a good point. What does it mean to be a citizen in this moment? Uh, Michelle Miller says, I focus on my students and mostly on how I can keep them safe to be realistic about their capacity and keep them moving forward to their goals. So again, this is Michelle as a professor here. I'm also frankless, frankly focused on my own safety and staying in close touch with my three adult children. Very, very good point. Very good point. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Ed Finn says he uh, agrees with Christopher and Wendy. This is a time to talk through the scenarios and through possibilities. Professional development for faculty navigating is a key. Ed, I can't tell if you're talking about our session right this moment or about November, but either way, I think it works. Uh, Steve Brown's an election official in New Hampshire. Uh, given the state's purple status, yeah, you might be working some long, cold nights. Um, Phil Katz asks, what about public higher education institutions? Are they insulated from the political persuasions of their governors? This is a very good question. So what happens to pick an example of, say, Texas? Uh, if faculty or administrators, staff or deans or students uh, take positions at University of Texas Austin, for example, how does that connect with uh, the governor there? David Stone mentions international students may become uncertain about their return next semester. Questions about course enrollment next term. A good point. Very, very good point. Michelle Miller asks too, is there a responsibility of, if there's a possibility of violence, we'd have to go to remote instruction. Mm -hmm. And we have practice in doing that thanks to COVID. Uh, Sean says after the recount, he's retiring and moving to Portugal. Uh, I, can, I can see that. I can see that. Uh, Joseph Robert Schaum is worried about the mental state of his students and so wants to open a dialogue with ground rules to de-escalate high emotions. John, uh, Joseph, that's a great idea. And I'm wondering for you and for everybody else, who on campus might assist with that? Uh, who might you turn to for help in trying to help that work? All right. Um, it sounds like a lot of ideas here. Uh, Chris says he, as an online teacher, COVID was a productive time, usually the PhD students. Uh, good point, good point. Uh, Brent Presley uh, adds that if institutions take a position on the election when they shouldn't, there could be employee departures. Uh, quite true, so we should anticipate some uh, walkouts or some resignations. Roxanne, um, as usual, has a really, really important point. She says, socials will explode with information always media experience. Videos, image, audio, possible disinformation, misinformation, factual information. It might be one of the best teaching and learning experience times. 
So just think about, for example, using if if uh, OpenAI's tool Sora becomes available uh, to have people generate a clip of President Biden saying he's resigning or a clip of, of candidate Trump saying that he concedes the race, for example. Very, very good point. Uh, Phil Katz says, I can imagine college is in an awkward position after encouraging students to vote they may feel a need to tamp down student activism after the election. Uh, good point. That goes back to the keep calm and carry on. So we have lots of energy going in, lots of activism, lots of excitement, and then the excitement is turning sour. Um, so trying to tamp that down. Uh, that's a very, very good point. Uh, Joe Lambert says he's studying the method and approach of the French resistance to develop a game for the underground networks on campuses. Indeed, that's an excellent way of um, thinking about uh, ways of doing that. Joe, I think there's at least one tabletop game on the French resistance. Um, can't think of the name offhand, but I'm a bit worth um, you know, consulting. Uh, Christopher Nelson adds, at this time, the explosion information will be filled with generative AI stuff. Uh, very much so. So we can imagine, for example, uh, books on Amazon uh, appearing right away, generated entirely by text bots. We can imagine blog posts. We can imagine social media of all kind. Uh, Chris adds, students and faculty might have a hard time focusing on work. Uh, this is a really good point. Where all this is going on, how can you do that? Um, Steve Brown wonders if students will be able to or be interested in class. Uh, again, they may be focused on the election, the possible futures. Or is class a refuge for some? So imagine if we have students or faculty or both asking for time off uh, from classes. Uh, Meredith Goldsmith adds, uh, some faculty members are feeling unsafe. With good reason. They're already afraid they might be in professional jeopardy. Uh, again, let me just uh, let me just put that on, on, on the screen here. Um, absolutely. Uh, I mentioned one possibility here of um, uh, the uh, conservative group uh, Turning Point, doxing professors. Uh, so you can imagine Turning Point also following uh, practice uh, from the year 2001 of coming up with a list of disloyal faculty uh, or faculty outrages. You could imagine groups like Libs of TikTok uh, trying to find more examples of that, uh, which could lead to threats. Uh, Michelle Miller is worried about the side picking dynamic a lot and trying to steer clear of that, to be honest. Not necessarily picking on election side, but more institutions, departments, faculty being pressed to make up formal statements. Yeah, that's going to be a hard thing to do to be neutral. Um, I mean, so you, know, you have two very, very passionate sides, and then to try to be neutral in order again to keep operations going and to help people think this, help students think this through. John Hollenbeck uh, would expect a, oops, I'm sorry, just lost it, would expect a decision to come within a week of the election outcome. Then a truly dangerous time happens. Uh, John, that's coming up uh, in the second part of the scenario. Uh, Phil Katz asks a really solid question. Are any students members of the National Guardians that get called into the streets? Uh, quite true. Uh, in fact, in my office in, or my uh, classroom in Georgetown, down the hall, literally, is a National Guard uh, office right there. Uh, Vanessa Vale says, although they should not be inoculated, sorry, although they should be inoculated, academics are not automatically immune to disinformation. Quite true. So think about what happens in campus when a professor or administrator or staff member shares a Facebook post or a tweet or a TikTok video that is disinformation. How do you respond to that? Um, Phil Katz uh, asks if colleges encourage or discourage students from engaging in politics in the streets. Uh, Phil, by streets, do you, do you mean off campus? I'm assuming you do. Um, uh, Joseph Robertson uh, adds that department heads and deans can help facilitate a town hall. I prefer counselors and DEI VPs for this, but we just got those folks decommissioned and gagged here in this wonderful state. I'm sorry to hear about that last point, but a town hall might be something that's a really, really good way to get information out, bring people together, but it could also be a place for um, political statements and perhaps more friction. Uh, Roxanne adds, academic stress and anxiety will increase even more than the present time. Quite true, quite true, which will have all kinds of effects on mental health, academic performance, and physical health. Uh, Ed Finn responds to Chris by saying, this is where faculty developers can help focusing, at least for faculty, by reinforcing the importance to education and helping students process. 
and her conversation the day after the 2016 election with a faculty member. Uh, it's a good point, Ed. If, if I could, back in 2001, fall after the September 11th attack, I helped uh, at the campus where I was teaching, I helped a bunch of faculty get together and do a kind of improv continuous teaching uh, every week with a bunch of students, other faculty and staff. We had uh, faculty from different departments. We had a biologist talking about anthrax. We had political scientists talking about geopolitics, a law professor talking about the legal dimensions and so on. Uh, Chris uh, says that his first term in college was during the invasion of Cambodia in Kent State. Classes were chaotic, poorly attended. Chris, wow. Uh, can you add any more from that uh, in terms of historical echo? Ellen Paul says, I'd be checking the emotional health of my students, possibly outside of class. Good point, Ellen. And again, I'd ask the question, who might be able to assist you in that, thinking about your own health and your own energy reserves? Uh, Seth Fierney says, as an instructor at American University Overseas, I would ask the president to organize at least weekly open sessions on how the American electoral system works and updates in the situation. Might invite the American ambassador to speak to the students. Great ideas, Seth. Great ideas. Uh, Joseph Robertson uh, would add news, sorry, would also feed all newscasts to AI and ask it for help to locate this information. Oh, very interesting idea. Joseph, have you tried the... Uh, uh, Google Gemini uh, double check where it takes its AI output against Google searches. Um, Vanessa says it's going dark. I wonder anyone else here old enough to remember Kent State. Uh, good question. Uh, good question, Vanessa. I mean, think about how much historical memory we have within academia and in society as a whole. What lessons we can learn from that. A uh, good friend of mine uh, at 18 was in the National Guard and sent out to patrol a street corner in Washington, D.C. after Martin Luther King was shot. Will Emerson says, most institutions should have policies for deploying National Guard troops. I had many students deployed during the troop surge in Iraq. Uh, good point, Will. Again, we, there's a lot we can learn from. We're not reinventing everything from scratch. Um, Vanessa was five miles away. Wow, Joseph. Uh, Ed Finn adds that town halls are good, but also one-on-one -on -one conversation is going to be crucial. Yes. Although they don't scale, they are crucial. Roxanne Riskin says debriefing in all ways imaginable should not be optional, but required. How might you do that, Roxanne? How might that work? Ellen Paul will remind students that we have more in common than we might have through our political differences. I would urge them to connect with others. Great insight or great desire, Ellen. Uh, Lauren Kelly, hello, Lauren, would be concerned about violence outbreaks on campus, particularly if citizens decide to take matters into their own hands, over, upset over the outcome of the election. Is the institution prepared to keep everyone safe? That's a great point, Lauren. Again, emerging here seems to be a dual theme of emotional safety, but also physical safety. Uh, Joseph Robertson says, not yet. Phil Katz gets meta and says, this conversation really gets the tension between student treating students as full citizens by age and birthright versus students understood as unformed civic actors who must be nurtured and protected by colleges. Ah, that's a really good point, Phil. That's a really, really good point. Um, hopefully that's a productive tension. Chris says that he was at or uh, he was at Chapman College and students took over the student union to organize. And we learned women did not like to be told to make the coffee. Yes. Um, but that's an interesting thought to imagine. Um, Two thoughts there. One is uh, students um, not just being part of teach-ins and town halls, but perhaps organizing to take steps, um, maybe uh, protesting at larger scales. And of course, divides um, uh, within uh, student populations over issues of identity and justice. Uh, Joseph Robertson uh, turns to a technology angle and as a discord, other closed social media should be used or could be used as communication to share news. Interesting, interesting. I, I wonder to what extent um, how we can do that when the social media environment is so fragmented. Uh, Vanessa says, stepping outside the higher ed environment, students, staff and faculty can cooperate in distributed networks to educate and inform the public. Yes, 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 yes. This is where town gown and public intellectuals really come in. Um, and again, there are risks to that. Uh, our campus is ready to support faculty, staff, and students who do that. Brent Presley, hello, Brent, says most people retreat to their echo chamber, listening to nothing but what they want to hear. Yeah, yeah, watching MSNBC or Fox and getting what you need to hear, keep following the people on social media that you want to hear from. Yes, the echo chamber is real. 
Uh, Steve Brown says if one group takes over campus spaces with students on the other side, organize take those spaces back. Good thinking. Good thinking. Uh, Paul adds that SUNY has a new local initiative. Um, I'll take a look at that link. Thanks, Paul. And John Hollenbeck says the largest generator of conflict will be uncertainty of the results. Well, John, you are right on this. And let me take this a little bit further. Uh, uh, thank you, Paul. I appreciate that on, on local news. So let's advance this to December. And by December, things are getting more and more out of hand. Uh, here, let me actually embiggen this so you all can see this. This is, uh, by the way, generated by uh, AI, as you can tell from the weird language on these. But I chose this in part because it's a good visualization, but also because it suggests the role AI might play. So unrest continues to grow. There is no clear outcome yet. Uh, and protesters across the country start to clash violently. Uh, this happens in some of the usual spots. You can think about, say, um, Portland, Oregon, or Washington, D.C., but also elsewhere. Uh, media coverage becomes more and more intense. Uh, it depicts, it responds to these clashes, uh, and which may in part accelerate them by giving more evidence of outrages on both sides. Now there is open talk by multiple states of seceding. Uh, we have states like South Dakota and Texas, which are talking about seceding uh, if Trump it does not win the election. Uh, we're seeing talk from blue states as well uh, of doing the same if Trump is certified uh, to be president. Uh, there are now outbreaks of violence between protesters and police. Um, and with more violence happening on the police side, uh, pictures of protesters being beaten, uh, of police being targeted by Molotov cocktails, rocks, and so on. Uh, federal and state office buildings uh, suffered some attacks, such as shooting, graffiti, bricks through windows, and they're hardening up now, uh, putting up barriers of all kinds, uh, troops being called out to protect them. Uh, the crisis worsens uh, as the South Dakota and Texas National Guard uh, exchange fire. Uh, with federal agents, and by agents I mean uh, federal government officials, but also FBI agents, um, and the president, President Biden, gets to call out um, the U.S. military. We see armed groups attacking state officials, uh, charging state officials with uh, disobeying the will of the people. Uh, we see military officials, not many, but some, making very provocative statements about the necessity for maintaining order uh, and law and about what they might be able to do in order to bring that about. Uh, the United States will, uh, econ economy is now in a great deal of free fall, and this is having impacts around the world, from European Union to China to India to the developing world. Global markets are, in short, in turmoil. Now, given all of that, given all of that, how would you respond in your role Again, as a faculty member, as a student, as a staff member, as a dean, as a trustee, as a librarian, or as a curator. And again, if that's the role you currently have or the role that you would like to have, uh, I'd like to I'd like you to talk about this, and then I'm going to put you into some groups to talk about it amongst yourselves a bit. Uh, Joseph Robertson says his online classes are taught in Discord. It serves as a good emergency notification system. Do you think, Joseph, and everybody else, that learning management systems would fulfill that role? Ellen Paul would urge the administration to go fully remote for the next semester. Uh, Ellen, you mean uh, spring 2025, to be sure? But I hope some kind of safety and normalcy. She hopes to create some kind of safety and normalcy in my online classes. Lauren Kelly asks a really good question. Is the college open? Uh, so the interesting question, if I turn that back to you, Laura, would be when would a college remain open and when would it close in this environment? Uh, Chris gets, if I may, a bit apocalyptic, saying that this is a time for back to the land and rural immigration, uh, helping immigration to the countryside, time to teach native plants and foraging. Thank you, Ellen. Lauren is thinking about this. Well, if you're all thinking about this and thinking hard about this, 
uh, learn their curfews all over the place uh, in different forms and different types, uh, usually at the state or at the county level. Uh, obedience to them is uneven. Enforcement varies, of course, from local police to National Guard. Um, and some places don't have a curfew. Will Emerson says, I live in the country. I'm not sure we have room for everyone to go back to the land. Yeah, yeah, the country can only support so many people. Uh, Seth Fierney says a priority needs to be protecting the campus facilities. So how do you do that, Seth and everybody? How do you physically protect uh, all of those facilities? Uh, Joellen Parker gets takes us to the academic apocalypse side of this. Enrollments plummet uh, and endowments do as well. So remember how many endowments are keyed to the stock market and investments. And as those markets are in free fall, this is bad news for any endowment. Um, no one's getting paid and no one's paying tuition. Joellen, do you think we'd see um, either tuition strikes openly or people who just don't think that the economic environment is worth supporting right now or that the academic experience is degraded a la COVID or the merging of instruction? Uh, Seth says, not my job. Understood, Seth. So for everybody else, it's an interesting question. How do you physically protect physical campus facilities? Uh, Michelle says, good point. Many of my students are residents of or have ties to the Navajo Nation, which has its own policies and can prevent them from coming or going, which will need to accommodate. Very, very good point. Uh, Phil Katz asks, is this the right time to have a teaching about the revolutionary role of university students in, say, 19th century France, the Russian Revolution, Tiananmen Square, et cetera? I would add uh, the Viennese students in uh, 1848 who basically took over that government. Uh, good idea. Steve Brown says, I'm thinking about Margaret Wheatley's invitation to create and hold space for islands of sanity within the chaos. How would a university collaborate with a local community to create such an island? Oh, great question, Steve. Great question. Joseph says, ultimately, I would reiterate with my students that the term of office is only four years, if it is by any way, and encourage voter registration. John Halbeck says, we'd be in a reactive role at this early stage. Keep those closest to us safe, maybe grouped together. Brent Presley adds that with the economy tanking, unemployment is spiking, so in addition to election uncertainty, there are financial security worries for many. Quite true, Brent. I mean, think about students whose family get unemployed, uh, faculty whose spouses lose their jobs. Um, and how the overall decline of the economy and how that impacts the campus community as well. Uh, Paul uh, asks us to think of institutional differences, as Phil Katz said earlier. How will the experience differ at, at universities and community colleges? It's a great point if we think of students who are residential versus commuter, thinking about students who are there for research, but also community colleges with their deep ties to the community. Joseph says, I would also be feeding people at this point asking for others to join me in that effort, like a campus food pantry, Joseph. Uh, Lauren says, just thinking, what if colleges did close? What happened to international students staying in residence halls? Aha, uh -huh, great question. Do they get left alone or the special cases made for them? Uh, Vanessa Vale says, how is this unrest affecting supply lines and basic services we take for granted? Quite true, Vanessa. What a very, very good point. Think, for example, if we have a trucking strike um, and how that shuts down food coming into an area. Uh, Shelly uh, Winans, hello Shelly, says, I think many faculty would be stressed and overwhelmed and looking to the campus to provide helpful guidance for the, all the campus community. I hope they would learn from COVID and get helpful info out to the campus quickly with resource services. Shelly, who would take the lead on that? Do you think that that's a presidential uh, task? Great, great comment. Uh, Steve Brown asks, what role would high, inside, excuse me, would in, I, I think you mean a higher education institution have a mutual aid work. Steve, do you mean mutual aid in emergency services or in some other sense? Uh, Chris says, I fear the crisis would be a tipping point. Shameless plug, see the APF compass on collapse. Chris, please share that link if, you, if you've got it there. Um, a tipping point into what too? Wendy Williams asks, how would experience different in public versus private universities? Being at a public school in a blue state, would we be more insulated? Interesting question. I imagine, though, I wonder how the uh, red citizens, if you will, when they at your institution, how they would react and how they'd feel. Brent Presley, one of the two candidates, is fanning the flames because, as Alfred Pennyworth would say, he likes to watch the world burn. Quite true, Brent. 
Ed Finn points out that leadership is key here. Recognizing difference, but still encouraging civil behavior is important. Uh, Steve says emergency services. Yeah, that's a good question. I wonder how many faculty, staff, and students are cross-trained in emergency services or have a role in that. Uh, can campuses play a role in, say, providing housing for distressed people? Shelley one in says it needs to be a campus task force, you know, campus admin leaders, which also has representatives from faculty, staff, and students. Um, oh, Ed Finn, uh, no problem that modeling civility while recognizing the need to protect physical and emotional safety. This is good. I, I don't mean the situation is good. I mean, all these responses are good. Let me give you quickly uh, five minutes in small groups to think about this. I want to make sure that everyone gets to participate. And I want to make sure you get uh, those of you who feel comfortable with small groups get a chance to do so. So I'm going to do this for five minutes and let's see how this goes. Again, in your groups, uh, take this further. Think about your role and how you might respond, but also think about how you responded to the November part and how that might play a role. Let's report back. Uh, let's see what people said. Uh, what did you find? What did your group come up with? What did you determine? Uh, Vanessa, let me just get a little closer to the uh, uh, to the mic, see if that helps. Um, and if, if you would like, please, here, let me put this uh, open podium up. Um, uh, if, if one of you from your groups can just uh, click on the on the podium, you can be brought up on stage right away, or if you'd like to type in text into the uh, Q&A box. Uh, Michelle Miller says uh, she appreciates hearing the perspective of those with the direct experience of the unrest of the late 60s and early 70s. So important, uh, so important to have that. I'm really glad to hear it. Uh, Wendy Williams says, maybe those of us who don't always have mic video enabled should be told to do that in advance. Oh, shoot. Wendy, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, um, well, I, I, let's, let's, let's work with, with uh, what we have right now. And next time, I'll absolutely do that. Thank you. Um, so what else did you find? Uh, what else did your groups come up with? And I'll pick on people if you don't. Uh, Vanessa wants to send Robert to the podium. Oh, that's easy. We can do that. I can pick on him right now. Uh, is that Roberto, uh, Vanessa, or is that Joseph Roberts? And while Vanessa's answering that and picking who gets to be up, how about the rest of you? Well, he does have a great beard, but uh, I can't find that Robert right now, Vanessa. He may have uh, he may have departed. So, oh, Joseph Robert Shaw. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll bring him right up on the stage right now because he does have a terrific beard. Hello, sir. Can you hear us? Oh, your, your mic is off. Yeah, you're, you're muted right now. Uh, Meredith says that in her role as co-curricular academic support, uh, I think I'd be focused on creating space for students to connect, share perspectives, learn about what's happening, and not feel so cut off and isolated, especially in the event of schools going remote. Uh, that's excellent, Meredith. Uh, what institution are you? Um, are you? At? I, I can't see from right here. Uh, Lauren, perhaps he was pursued by a bear. Uh, Charles Finley uh, shares that in his group that they can't continue classroom operations as usually. Uh, oh, you're at RISD. Uh, good to hear it, Meredith. Well, let's just let me just ask you to all think about that from from Charles for a second. Uh, this has come up um, uh, from a few people. Uh, so, what happens if it's December 2024? So, this is only you know less than a year from now. What happens if election unrest is so strong? 
that it becomes impossible for the campus to operate. Uh, so how do you plan for that right now? Uh, do you have a, a plan already in place if this is going to occur? Uh, Vanessa, no problem, of course. Uh, Lauren Kelly says that uh, we chatted about the other issues that everyone was facing at the time, like COVID. I know I was in Florida, so we had a hurricane and COVID, so things might have been worse. But there was so much happening at the time. Uh, that's a good point, um, that other things can be happening at the same time. I mean, think about geopolitics. Think, of course, about the implications of the economy. And think about AI. There's a lot going on. Uh, John points out, there go finals. I'm so glad you said that, John, uh, because that was one of the reasons I put this timeline up. How are you going to have final exams and final projects if uh, all of this is going on at the same time? Uh, so do you, you, know, you think about what happened, for example, with COVID? Do we have pass-fail or alternative grading? Uh, Wendy asks or points out that if the LMS is working, we can keep going, but I don't have a plan B for that. Mm. This might be a finding for our discussion today, is to actually set up such a plan B. Uh, Chris points out climate change. I'm so glad, Chris. I'm so glad, Chris, to, to point that out, because climate change won't be stopped by uh, the outcome, by the machinery of an election. Uh, so fires, floods, um, heat waves are all there as well. Charles Finley uh, as that there was some resistance to going to remote learning, suggesting that students might need support from each other. So that would be interesting to see how that plays out. You might remember in March, February, March of 2020, how uh, campuses trickled and then a flood went online in a hurry. Maybe this will be something where campuses will think about this in different ways, uh, perhaps sending some students home, but not others, some faculty and staff home, but not others. Uh, Chris points out that first responders could be distracted, yes. Um, you know, thinking about fire, thinking about police, thinking about EMTs uh, as this kind of violence begins to unspool. Uh, Roxanne uh, says that she had many students with severe emotional outbursts during the Clinton-Trump election type. Uh, an inclusive plan needs to be made for physical and psychological safety. Mm -hmm. I agree. I experienced that as well. Uh, so we do need to have that kind of plan in place now. Uh, John Holmbeck uh, points out that campus academic reorganization will be more of a spring semester thing. November and December will be reactive to the chaos. Okay, so in November, December, you know, looking ahead to spring term um, and how to plan that. So this is, I mean, this is really tricky to think about, how there's the immediate reaction to what's going on day by day, but then trying to figure out how to plan for spring 2025. Michelle takes us even darker. Here's a nightmare scenario. Violence targets uh, institutions of higher education and faculty with impunity due to promised immunity. So let me see if I got you right, Michelle. Just say hypothetically that um, uh, a Republican leader um, says if you go ahead and do some violence against a, uh, a communist professor or a trans staff member, that then uh, I'll pardon you. Um, you'll be good to go. Um, Faculty told they have to come in person anyway in order to dismissal. In some universities, the faculty be purged en masse this way. This is a very dark scenario, but you can see that happening. And we had this kind of argument during COVID, during various closures. Uh, would faculty or staff be ordered to come to campus? Would campuses be safer or more dangerous places? Uh, that's a really, uh, that's a really good scenario. I, I mean, good as in well thought out, not good as in a happy one, of course. Uh, Steve Brown wonders, given how organized some of the Christian nationalist community are, might such a group target a campus for takeover, maybe in the Northwest? Would WSU, I'm not sure what that stands for, is that uh, be an easy target, for example? Uh, makes me think of Wayne State University, Steve. Um, but yeah, we could imagine that, especially if a campus is, people perceive it as being a source of dissent and unrest. Meredith Goldsmith, uh, adds that during COVID, I supported faculty making decisions about what they wanted to accomplish in their courses. This is an opportunity to identify what's really essential and what isn't. Ah, oh, Meredith, what a powerful idea. Um, by the way, in what, what role did you have then? Uh, were you an uh, educational technology, uh, learning and center leader? Um, but making us rethink classes and what they're about, trying to find the critical path for our curriculum. Uh, Vanessa claims sundowning due to age, but it's not to alarm folks more uh, considering election results topic. 
Um, well, this is an issue, though. I, I mean, it, having this session today, uh, imagining this kind of planning uh, will alarm people. Uh, Charles Finley uh, writes that it is possible to con consciously provide support from another virtually, as I think we sometimes do in this forum here. One of my first exposures from well-wishers around the world to a colleague who was scheduled for surgery. Yeah, so, okay, so how can campuses and individual faculty, staff, and students prepare for that? Uh, and how do we structure that? Do we have a set up individual um, Slack channels? Do we set up Discord channels? Do we use the LMS and so on? Uh, Phil Katz asks this good question. How would students and others react to some efforts described here to keep schooling as normal as possible while the nation has an existential constitutional crisis? It could make colleges seem even less relevant. This is a good point. If you think, for example, that you're that the country is sliding into fascism or Marxism or terror, why do I need to keep studying cell biology when I should be in the streets, when I should be helping solve this problem? Uh, you could see, again, as Joelle and Parker pointed out, you could see students disenrolling, either quitting formally or just not showing up for class. The same for faculty and staff. Roxanne brings back to technology. There might be a time for higher cyber attacks directly at higher education that I even considered. Yeah. So how many ransomware attacks or just denials of service or malware? Uh, oh, watching the State University. Thank you, Steve. Sorry, D just totally missed that. Uh, Michelle says, yes, cyber attacks. We have to th think about how IT has to plan for this. Um, oh, Meredith was the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. Fantastic, Meredith. What a great position to be in to do that. Uh, Joelle and Parker takes us back to boards. They have to determine how much risk they're willing to afford on, to assume on behalf of the institution. So I think about it, think about the trustees and think about the boards, how they have to decide: should we keep the camp, should we keep the campus op open physically? Should we go online, a la COVID? Should we shut down and suspend? Think about the risks of violence as well as being sued by students, faculty, and staff. Excellent, excellent point. Uh, Wendy asked if the check had saved the recording. It does not. But Wendy, if you like, um, I could if or I put it this way: if nobody objects, uh, I can post this uh, to a blog. Uh, anonymized and uh, um, in order to uh, keep everybody off. If anyone has an objection to that, please uh, put that in, in the chat let me know. Uh, Chris says, comment. I want my colleagues at Southern New Hampshire University to see, I'm oh, sorry, at NHU. Yes, yeah, Southern New Hampshire University to see this webinar. Chris, we're recording it right now and uh, it'll be up on YouTube in a couple of days, depending. Vanessa says, multiple networks, like Klingon neural networks. Nice. Uh, no objection from Chris. Thank you. Michelle Miller asked, for, maybe we need to set up alternative hubs of sorts to provide affiliations for people who have been purged or let go. Or somebody looking for kind of positions abroad or both. Uh, good point. Good point. Uh, John Hollenbeck gets meta again. What would the reaction be if news of this planning or post-election chaos gets out now? Can you imagine the headlines? Well, that's a great point. Uh, again, thinking about uh, the exchange that Vanessa and I had, let me ask all of you, um, just before before we wrap things up, um, let me ask you to take a deep breath. Uh, this was an exciting session and a bit scary, I think. Um, what did you think? Was this a useful exercise? Uh, should we do it again? Is there anything we should do differently? Uh, what do you think about what we just did for this past hour? And again, if you want to climb on stage, just click the podium. The, the teal color podium button and uh, and just feel free to talk. Um, Meredith uh, asks a really, really good question. So before we get to the meta part, is there any way that some standard features of higher ed survive this? What happens to shared governance in the tenure system? Oh, I love the way you think. Uh, Wendy says, this was useful and interesting. If we do it again, I turn on video. Absolutely, sorry about that. Um, Chris says, we need to explore many alternative futures of high rate, green, transhumanist, and collapse. Yes, and Chris, we've done a couple of these so far. We've done a couple on AI, and we did one on uh, solar punk. So more of this. Um, Joe says, I think someone doesn't know there is a mic, doesn't know their mic is on. Um, Roxanne says, this is important. This event could be transformational. Chris, let me know what to do to make it more so. Uh, Will says, this is interesting. Uh, well, polling questions are a good idea. Um, that's a really good idea. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. 
uh, Lauren likes that we had AI generated images. Thanks, thanks. Um, I got some really scary ones in, in that lot. Uh, John said uh, he'd be interested in having more higher ed scenarios comment on the scenario. Maybe John, and we've had some here, um, uh, including former presidents and deans, maybe uh, I should take this to some other administrators, take the recording and point this out to them uh, and ask them uh, for their thoughts. Well, we have the end of the hour right now, so I'm going to need to wrap this up. Uh, Lauren says, I could see you doing this as activity for faculty and other subjects and concepts. Yeah, I'd be, that's a great idea, Lauren. Please run with that. I'd be happy to help. Um, Wendy says, there's an episode of The Handmaid's Tale where they're stringing up academics. Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Um, see, I stopped this scenario in December because I just wanted to focus on the immediate part we could take this further. Uh, Steve says, are there any institutions using scenario thinking exercises? Uh, a few, um, not many. Uh, I've been trying to help people to do more of that. Uh, Vanessa wonders, how many groups are already forming networks? Good point, good point. Well, um, I, need to, uh, I need to wrap this up. So let me just um, put some of this together. Um, so I hope this was useful. Uh, I hope this was thought provoking uh, and I would love to hear more and more of what you'd like to say. If you'd like to talk about it right now uh, further, uh, please you know, hit up the socials, use the hashtag FTTE. Uh, I'm going to blog about this as soon as I can. Um, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions, which have covered some of these issues, both we've had several scenario exercises, but also we've talked about things like nationalism and political uncertainty. Uh, please go back to our archive at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, we have sessions coming up on all sorts of topics which are very different. You can find them on the forum website, forum.futureofeducation.us. Uh, I always love talking and thinking with all of you about the future of education. Uh, I think you were a brilliant, splendid community. Um, this means a lot to me. Uh, and I really appreciate just how thoughtful all of you were in this hour, thinking through a very, very difficult problem. Uh, I appreciate your participation. I appreciate your reflections. Um, and I uh, really hope we can do this um, further. Uh, I hope all of you, I thank you again. I hope all of you are safe and sound. I uh, hope you stay well. and. Let please reach out to me if you have any thoughts along along the lines of this topic or this uh, scenario. Take care, everybody. See you next time online. Bye bye. <laughs>